May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. The first woman to speak in the Christian scriptures is an outsider with no name. She is given the title Canaanite woman as a title of disregard. Then, in the course of fighting for her daughter's life, saving her daughter from the onslaught of demon possession, she is told to get lost by the disciples of Jesus, the founders of the Christian church. Wait, it gets worse. Then, she is completely ignored and referred to as a dog by none other than Jesus, our Savior. Our beloved Lord treats this woman as a displaced person. He chooses to ignore her, and then when he does speak to her, he disdains to even address her in order to dismiss her. All of these rituals of cross-gender, cross-cultural, cross-religious, cross-economic conversations are painful to behold. This woman has no voice and represents no human presence to the disciples or Jesus. All these men treat her like the, she is less than dirt when all she wants is help. This scene is disgraceful. The saving grace of this horrible story is the woman herself. Her persistence, her determination, her toughness, and her true faithfulness prevails. When told to leave, she doesn't move. When treated with silence, she kneels before Jesus and cries out into his face, Lord, help me. When called a dog who deserves nothing at all, she says, even dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. It is this unrelenting nature and this witty reply that finally grabs Jesus' attention. She awakens him as though he has been in a cruel trance and he remembers he is Mary's son. He remembers that he is human too. He remembers that he's capable of saving both this woman and her daughter. He remembers that he is the embodiment of God's grace. And once he remembers, he acts like it. He finally hears her. He sees her. He responds to her impassioned cries for help. He heals her daughter as he says, O oh, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. Now, how hard was that, Jesus? Couldn't you have said that when she first cried out? Oh, this woman has challenged all of the ethnic, gender, religious, and economic barriers that stand between her and all of them. And it is her persistence that prevails over Jesus' obstructions. Let me be bolder. This woman's faith, this woman with no name, prevails over his lack of regard, his lack of acknowledgement, and lack of compassion. Her faith awakens Jesus to realize that she is human. She is equal to him as a human being, and she deserves the fullness of healing power, as does her daughter, just as much as any man does. The first time a woman speaks in the Christian scriptures, we encounter full-blown misogyny. Misogyny 
quite simply as this. It is the hatred of, the contempt of, the prejudice against women and girls. Misogyny enforces sexism by punishing those who reject an inferior status for women and rewarding those who accept it. Misogyny manifests itself in numerous ways, including social exclusion, sex discrimination, hostility, patriarchy, male privilege, belittling of women, disenfranchisement of women, violence against women, and sexual objectification of women. Misogyny is full-blown in this text today, in case you're not paying attention. It can be found in many other texts of Scripture, and certainly it can be found in Western and Eastern philosophy as well. It is everywhere to be experienced and to be seen by women. For men to see it, we need to take off our blinders. Maybe we need women just like this Canaanite woman to awaken us and make us pay attention to them. That's what we need. We need to see like Jesus finally sees and like his disciples finally see that there is a human being in front of them. And we have to be awakened, a process which should not be the responsibility of women to force or establish upon us as men. Too often we carry on unaware of that which is right in front of us and that which we are actively or passively participating in, and that needs to change. Harry T. Byrne was a man who needed awakening. It took his mother to awaken Harry. I'm sure by now you all know who I'm talking about, Harry T. Byrne. You know him. He was the man responsible for casting the final vote in the 36th state of the Union, the one needed to finally ratify the 19th Amendment. Harry was a 24-year-old Republican representative from Mouse Creek, Tennessee. Mouse Creek is now named Nyota, in case you're traveling there anytime soon. He was the youngest member of the Tennessee House of Representatives, having been elected at 22 years old. Representative Byrne, had originally intended to vote for the 19th Amendment, but then he was pressured by party leaders, and he kept receiving misleading telegrams and letters from constituents telling him that his district overwhelmingly opposed women's suffrage. So he began to side with the anti-suffragists. However, his mother wrote a letter to him. She asked her son, her oldest, her firstborn, to vote in favor of the amendment, and that changed his mind. Feb Byrne had written a long letter to her son, which he held in his coat pocket as he took to the floor of the house on August 18, 1920. The letter contained the following sentences, the one that changed Harry's vote including these words, Dear son, hurrah, and vote for suffrage, and don't keep them in doubt. I noticed that Chandler's speech was very bitter. I've been watching to see how you stood, but I have not seen anything yet. Don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Thomas Cat with all of her suffragist the rats is what they were referred to. Is she the one that put rat in ratification? Ha, ha, ha. No more from Mama this time with lots of love, Mama. Of course, Mrs. Thomas Cat was Carrie Chapman Cat, one of our nation's leading suffragists, the president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association and the founder of the League of Women Voters. After much debating and argument, the result of the vote in Tennessee was 48 to 48. After Harry Byrne voted twice to table the amendment, the House Speaker finally looked at him and called for the vote based on merit. Burns followed his mother's advice and voted yes. His vote broke the tie 
in favor of ratifying the amendment. He responded to attacks on his integrity and his honor by inserting a personal statement in the Tennessee House Journal, explaining his decision to cast the vote in part because, quote, I knew that my mother's advice is always safest for a boy to follow, that a mother's advice is always safest for a boy to follow, and my mother wanted me to vote for ratification. Thanks be to God for Feb Byrne and her oldest son, Harry. And thanks be to God truly and forever for Carrie Chapman Cat and for Alice Paul and for Lucy Stone and for Ida B. Wells Barnett and the founding mothers of the movement, which grew out of the abolitionist movement, Susan B. Anthony, Lucretia Mott, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Sojourner Truth, and the generations of suffragettes who fought for over 70 years from Seneca Falls to Nashville, Tennessee, to see that women had the right to vote. I need to add an important note today because I've been reminded by both friends and colleagues, women have written me about this, that the movement for women's suffrage suffered from a racial bias against black women and other women of color a sad reflection on the racial bias in our nation. Even when the 19th Amendment was ratified, not all African-American women gained the right to vote in August 1920 because Jim Crow laws in the South crushed black men and, of course now, black women from voting until 1965. Beyond Sojourner Truth and Ida B. Wells Barnett, there were many women of color who fought for women's rights to vote, including Zakata uh, Sa Yankton, a Sioux writer and advocate, later Mary Church Terrell, who co-founded the National Association of Color Women, Colored Women, the NACW, and Mabel Ping Hugh Lee, who at 16 years old was one of the key leaders for the New York City Women's March on Suffrage. Days after the 19th Amendment was set into law in August 1920, Carrie Chapman Catt wrote these words in a memo to the women of America. The vote is the emblem of your equality. Women of America, the guarantee of your liberty. That vote of yours has cost millions of dollars and the lives of thousands of women. Women have suffered agony of soul which you can never comprehend that you and your daughters might inherit political freedom. That vote has been costly. Prize it. The vote is a power. It is a weapon of offense and defense. It is a prayer. Use it intelligently, conscientiously, prayerfully. Progress is calling you to make no pause. Act. All of her words resonate with me, but the echo of these phrases move continuously through my heart and mind. That phrase, that vote of yours, has been costly. It is a prayer. Use it intelligently, conscientiously, prayerfully. In these weeks in which we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Tennessee ratification, in this week, we celebrate this ratification of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution and the final acceptance of the 36 states voting and needing to ratify the amendment on August 26th. We are reminded once again that women have had to fight for rights for equality under the law seemingly forever. Gaining the vote is only one example of how hard and how long this battle has truly gone on. In an article published June 12, 2020 in the Cincinnati Enquirer entitled 100 Years Later, Ohio's track record of electing female leaders remains abysmal Jesse Balmert and Jackie Bochart write, Ohio was one of the first states to ratify the women's right to vote. 
But ever since, the state has trailed the nation in notching important firsts for female elected leaders. June 16th marks the 100th anniversary of Ohio lawmakers ratifying the 19th Amendment, which states the right to vote shall not be denied on account of sex. Suffragists who fought for that amendment imagined a future where Ohio women would participate in politics on the same level as their male counterparts. But a century later, Ohio is one of 20 states that has never elected a female governor and one of 18 states that has never elected a U.S. senator who is a woman. In fact, Ohio is just one of six states that has never seen a major party nominee of a woman for governor. After a century, only nine women have held statewide non-judicial elected office in our state's history. Here at First Church, we have been blessed by Representative Dr. Mary Lightbody, who currently serves in the Ohio House of Representatives. And one of those nine women was for many years a member of this church, former Secretary of State Jennifer Brunner, Judge Brunner, Thank you, Mary and Jennifer, for your courage and running and winning. The article points out multiple challenges that women face in running for elected offices. There are many challenges that pose hurdles that are not there for men. But I would like to point out the tremendous advantages of having women leaders in critical positions of leadership in such a time as this. During the coronavirus pandemic, the leadership of three amazing women leaders stand out in my mind. Jacinda Ardern, Prime Minister of New Zealand since 2017. Angela Merkel, Chancellor of Germany since 2005. And Gina Raimondo, who is Governor of Rhode Island since 2015, have all been exceptional leaders. All three women have crushed the curve of COVID-19 by calling their nations and state to work together and then putting in place strict guidelines that made it happen. As Governor Raimondo said recently, all the key leaders in key positions in Rhode Island who are addressing COVID-19 are women. Just so happens we're all moms. We think like moms. We act like moms. We serve and protect our citizens like they're our family. And we don't give up, a trait she attributes to all of them being moms. Well, you don't have to be a mom to be a great woman leader. The image of these leaders showing their compassion and genuine concern about the health and well-being of every citizen in Rhode Island is what is needed at such a time as this. In the case of Prime Minister Ardern, when COVID came to New Zealand, she called her nation to act like one team and move forward together like one team. They did, and they crushed COVID-19 together as a team. In the case of Chancellor Merkel, a scientist by training, she broke down the steps to crush COVID-19 like she was talking to third graders, her words, in a science class. Merkel rarely speaks to the nation so everyone tuned in when she said she was going to talk to them. It's amazing how saving your speech when you really need it makes a difference. Because when she talked, she was clear, she was short, she was concise, and she, she united everyone with the directives she had. Then both countries implemented their plans and crushed the bug. In the process, they saved lives, and they got their economies back to functioning within six weeks. Amazing. Working together as one team, following simple scientific evidence and proven steps, moms delivering effective plans can crush COVID-19. Women make a way while too many men flounder and get in their own way and equivocate. My words. In this week when we are recognizing and celebrating women's rights to vote, when the third woman in American history will be nominated as a vice presidential candidate by a major political party, 
We need to see that voting really matters in pandemic times. Voting can literally, in these times, save lives. So we need to pay attention and participate actively in the voting process in this region, in this state, and in this nation. In the words of the Canaanite woman trying to get Jesus' attention, help me. I pray that we see her and that we hear her cries and the cries of women crying out to us in these times. Her cries are the cries of women down through the ages. Her faith turned Jesus around. She converted him to believe. Carrie Chapman Catt was right. The vote is a prayer. The vote is a prayer. We need to pray this November. We need to act through our vote. And may we do everything in our power to treat the vote as sacred for all those who have fought so hard and so long to make it real. As John Lewis said in his final letter to the nation published on the day of his funeral, July 30th, ordinary people with extraordinary vision can redeem the soul of America by getting in what I call good trouble, necessary trouble, voting and participation in the democratic process are key. The vote is the most powerful nonviolent change agent you have in a democratic society. You must use it because it is not guaranteed. You can lose it. Lesson number four, use the vote intelligently. Use the vote conscientiously. Use the vote prayerfully. Amen.